of our special seminar series, Circuits, Terahertz and Beyond. This semester we hosted a number of leading circuit designers that are working on uh, terahertz circuits and millimeter waves, and we learned a lot about uh, those circuits. Uh, on NYU Wireless is sponsored by a large number of industrial affiliates that are supporting our research activities in the area of uh, wireless technologies. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our uh, final seminar speaker, Professor Arun Natarajan. Uh, Professor Natarajan's research focuses on integrated circuits and systems for high data rate wireless communications and imaging applications. Professor Natarajan uh, is, prof uh, is a professor faculty at uh, Oregon State University. Before joining Oregon State University, he was a research, research staff member at IBM TJ Watson from 2007 to 2012. He's serving on the uh, committees of ISSCC, which is a uh, premier circuit design conference and has many accolades, including NSF Career Award. Um, today, we are excited to learn about his latest research on integrated millimeter wave MIMO arrays. Please join me in welcoming Professor Natarajan. Thanks, Dawood. Um, thank you very much for being here, and I should thank uh, Professor Rappaport as well for inviting me to be a part of this seminar. I'm uh, happy to be the last speaker. Hope uh, that the talk lives up to all the preceding ones. The, um, uh, it, as Dawood mentioned, I was up the, uh, you know, uptown or a little bit more north at IBM T.J. Watson before I moved to Oregon State. So it's a Happy homecoming of sorts to, for me as well. So thanks again for inviting me. The talk today, um, I'm going to focus on um, where we have been in the uh, silicon, in building silicon arrays and what we are going to do next. The talk is structured more, uh, I'm not going to do a very deep dive into the circuits. I'm happy to answer questions uh, both during the talk and offline, but I will give you a more a sense of what the circuits can do for these arrays and what are the problems that we are trying to address. So um, I'll begin by giving a historical overview of uh, phased arrays over the last 15 years. It's not a, a it doesn't go back further than that. Um, so just to introduce uh, where I am now, so I teach at Oregon State University, which is about uh, an hour and a half south of uh, uh, Portland. Uh, Oregon, uh, Portland is where young people go to retire, and uh, Oregon State is where even old people and young people go to retire. So it's a very bucolic community. It's uh, a fantastic place to live, and. Uh, uh, this is our Kelly Engineering Center, and we have a pretty big program in integrated electronics with people working right from sensor systems all the way to communication systems. I sit somewhere here at the interface between the analog uh, and mid-signal converters and the systems people. Um, so I should acknowledge that the work that I'm going to be presenting was all done by the students in the high-speed integrated circuits group that I direct at Oregon State. Um, we've, uh, uh, we've had the group going for about six years now, and it's been exciting to both build this group and watch students as they graduate and take up positions in research labs and industry and start contributing to the community. Uh, also, all this work would not be possible without uh, resources which are provided for by our funding sponsors, which have included both DOD and industry. We also have had NSF and NIH money on building uh, some of these uh, arrays. The work that I'll be talking about, a lot of it has been funded by DARPA. Um, and also acknowledge uh, collaborators. Uh, so I was at IBM Research for a number of years and at Oregon State, I've collaborated with faculty in both uh, integrated electronics and the systems area. We have collaborators at other universities and uh, industry as well, Intel and TI. So um, what does the wireless landscape look like today? So what is happening today is that spectrum below 6 gigahertz is scarce. I've put an asterisk there because the cognitive radio people will say that it's not actually scarce. There is spectrum available. It's just allocated badly, and it's allocated in a fixed time 
uh, intervals and it's not used uh, very often and we could do coordinative radio and use it better. But primarily there is still uh, the way the allocations are done, spectrum is um, uh, available only in limited quantities below 6 gigahertz. And the way that we have tried to solve this is uh, by increasing densification, so making cells smaller, so increasing frequency reuse, which creates interfeders uh, in each of these cells because of neighboring cells as well as uh, because sometimes communication has to happen across femto and macro cells. The other way that we have tried to solve this uh, spectrum challenge is by taking available spectrum wherever it is and trying to aggregate that, that together to achieve communication. So uh, this creates from an analog circuit's perspective an interferer challenge, both of this. So we are now trying to design radios that are interferer tolerant primarily and can basically achieve complex filtering in order to enable these kind of carrier aggregation problems. The other motivating force is that there are wide uh, bandwidths available at spectrum in the higher centimeter wave and at millimeter wave frequencies. NYU has done pioneering work, pioneering work in promoting the use of uh, uh, millimeter wave or high centimeter wave for cellular and there are applications for automotive radar, there are applications for wireless backhaul. And in all these, however, the challenge that we find is that integrated devices, if you want to keep it low cost, we need to have uh, arrays in order to close the link budget. And we need arrays in order to provide us good spatial resolution if we want to do sensing applications. So prior speakers in the seminar have provided introductions on phased arrays. So I'm kind of skipping past that and just providing a quick overview of the key benefits of why we are doing arrays. So from a phased array perspective, uh, a major reason that we do arrays is that uh, if we use uh, N elements, the noise at all these elements is uncorrelated, while the signals are uh, coherently added. As a result, we theoretically get a factor of N improvement in the signal to noise ratio in the array. Uh, the other benefit that we have is that the receiver is receiving signals from a focused direction. So hopefully interferers are getting nulled out here, which protects signals after the combiner. From a transmitter perspective, we build arrays primarily, but again, to focus the radiated power in a specific direction. We can show that if we start with a single element power and we want to achieve a certain radiated power, and we compare that with an N element array, we can drop the power in each element by a factor of um, n squared. So uh, this leads to uh, significant uh, reductions in the power that we require in each element, which makes integration possible. The other uh, benefit is that uh, we, if we increase the array size, we are increasing our spatial resolution. So these are uh, the driving forces behind going to arrays. So what has been done in arrays over the last 15 years in integrated arrays? So phased arrays have been known for a long time, 100 years now, and uh, people had been building them with discrete uh, and uh, uh, discrete uh, mimic implementations before. But in 2004, uh, the group that I was part of during my PhD, uh, we demonstrated the first uh, uh, phased array at uh, 24 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, so this was a receiver and this was a companion transmitter. And then uh, we showed that we could apply uh, similar techniques to go up to 77. The community picked up on that and soon there were a lot of demonstrations leading to, uh, these are industrial demonstrations at 60 gigahertz of uh, phased arrays. And what you will see is that uh, the complexity of the array and the number of elements is increasing. So the for, for the first few years from an IC design perspective, we were focused on solving challenges that are related to the phased array. How do we implement RF phase shifters? What architectures we should use for phase shifting? Should we do it at LO? Should we do it at RF? Should we do it at IF? How do we combine the signals? How do we distribute the signals? How do we uh, design each element so that it occupies a compact area? So these were the kind of problems that we were trying to address. But I would say that over the last several years, we have matured in this. We, we have a pretty good handle on how to build these arrays. So next, we started wondering how do we build even larger arrays. So the 
one's approach is to put a lot of elements on one IC, but that doesn't work out practically from a testing perspective or even from uh, a design perspective. So what we started doing was to look at unit cell approach, where we made these unit cells and we combine these unit cells. So for example, here, there are four of these ICs that are placed together inside the package and connected together to form a large array, which is 64 elements. So we did this unit uh, uh, cell approach. And uh, over the last couple of years, I would say that this approach is maturing, where now we have gotten a, a 64 element, a 288 element, a, a 144 element array. So we are getting uh, more and more uh, sophisticated in the way in which we tile these arrays to build um, uh, large scale systems. So. Uh, uh, master slash slave ICs have been built that can be configured as uh, combining signals from other ICs or that can function as the element in the array. We have built complex packages with all these multiple antennas that interface to these unit cell ICs. So uh, there has been a lot of research uh, in packaging and uh, uh, co-design of IC with the package that has gone on to achieve this. So now that we are here, what is the next set of problems? Uh, uh, what do we need to worry about? If we actually look at the arrays that we have been building by the unit cell tiling, the, one of the things is that um, we ideally want to have lambda over two spacing between the antennas to build a dense aperture in the array. But uh, just the fact that the circuits that we need for each element occupy a certain amount of space and then we need to, um, uh, tile this and we need to distribute signals on the package uh, prevents us from achieving full density at uh, millimeter wave frequencies. Because as we increase the frequency of operation, the wavelength is decreasing. So the space, the physical space that we have in order to still maintain a lambda over two spacing between elements becomes really tight. So this has been, uh, as you see, a, a problem. But on the other hand, if you see the demonstrations, what we are doing is that even though these apertures are not dense, we are building larger apertures, as I showed in the previous slide. So this shows a plot of the number of elements in the array, which is, I mean, this is restricted to integrated arrays as a function of years. And you can see that the first few years we were focused on single, element, single IC implementations. And then over the last few years, the community has been focused on building tiled implementations to larger arrays to larger arrays. So um, uh, what are the problems that we face? Firstly, we have this problem that we need to make uh, the array still more compact. Transmitter efficiency is still a problem because uh, this is fundamental as we, uh, and determines how much power we are burning in these arrays, which is a particular problem because as we try to make these large arrays, removing heat from the package and the IC is a significant problem. Uh, receiver linearity, particularly in the context of what I'm going to talk about, is a problem. And then we have to figure out a way to make sure that all these ICs that are part of the tile are coherent. So we have to distribute LO signals. And we have to build IF interfaces to take all these signals away from the ICs. So this also remains a, a significant problem. So going forward, one of the things that we are um, uh, seeing is that we are building phased arrays where we are taking all these N receivers or, uh, and combining their signal. And once we combine the signal, so for example, if we have desired signals from multiple directions, once I build a phased array that is looking in a particular direction, I do get rid of the jammer, but I get rid of desired signals from other directions as well. So I'm basically losing spatial information or I'm throwing it away in the combiner. Ideally, what we would like to do is have a flexible architecture where I, I digitize the information in every chain and I'm able to build a multi-beam array in digital which can look in multiple directions at the same time. So I don't throw away spatial information. But in this case, the problem that I have is if there is the jammer, it is present in every element right through to digitization, whereas in the phase array, it gets attenuated before the digitization. So this means now that my ADC dynamic range must be sufficient to accommodate this jammer. And this is a critical problem because increasing the ADC dynamic range means increasing the effective number of bits. 
So what we are talking about for each bit is about a 2 h to 4 h power consumption increase if you look at typical state-of-the-art ADCs. So what we see is this uh, scenario where um, if I try to build a, a digital uh, array, uh, I can look at the power consumption across and if I consider my earlier ADC to consume about 25 milliwatts and I need two of them because I want to do IQ digitization, the power consumption, if I want to increase two more bits in order to accommodate the jammers, the power consumption goes up to 100 to 400 milliwatts. So uh, this is clearly one challenge with building digital arrays in the presence of jammers. And um, secondly, that uh, we want to have a lot of reconfigurability. So increasingly, in my view, the way that we uh, are trying are going to build uh, RF transceivers and millimeter wave transceivers is not from a perspective of signal selection, but from the perspective of signal rejection. We want to do the selection in the digital interface. We want to pick the directions. We want to pick the frequencies we want to receive digitally. But in the analogs uh, part of it, what we want to do is null arrays or try to uh, reject uh, interferers. And um, so this also leads to this question, which is, if we are building these digital arrays, does a single transceiver chain replicated n times, is that the only solution? Can we do something in the analog in order to improve performance? Or are we better off just optimizing a single receive chain and uh, just arranging n of them in order to build the array? So if we uh, look at uh, the, what the phased array was providing us, it was basically rejecting the interferer uh, uh, and uh, uh, letting us look in a desired direction. But now what we would ideally want to do is imagine a world where I have these desired signals in all directions and I have this interferer. What I somehow want to do in my analog is I want to reject the interferer. Let's say that I'm able to isolate and localize the interferer. I want to go and subtract it from each element so that my effective pattern at each element looks something like this where I effectively have a spatial null in my pattern. So this is the pattern at each element. Now, I can make this null in digital using uh, digital beamforming techniques, but in order to preserve linearity, what I want to do is do this cancellation early in the chain. I could do this at analog, I could do this at RF at the output of the LNAs, or I could even try to start doing it at the antenna. So imagine that you had a MIMO array where each antenna had a pattern like this where it would reject one particular uh, direction. Now imagine that you wanted to extend this to multiple interferers. So could you do that? Where your each antenna pattern looks like it has spatial nulls uh, in particular directions, or you're basically trying to reject signals based on a certain angle of incidence and a certain frequency, and then trying to uh, build a uh, Uh, circuit implementations that uh, achieve this. So as I mentioned, what I want to do is be able to sense signals from certain specific directions and reject them. So the way that I do that is I sense the signal.
So my canceller becomes noisy. So overall, if I, while doing this interferer cancellation, introduce a lot of noise, then I have basically gained on my dynamic range by reducing the interferer, but I have lost on my dynamic range at the lower end because I've introduced noise. So this is the trade-off that we are trying to meet. So what we came up with was an innovative input coupling block where essentially now what, so these are some of the benefits that integration provides. So typically, Power. So you're not losing power and you're not introducing noise while still sensing the voltage of the signal. So we detect that voltage and you can see here, for example, that if I look at the output here compared to port 2, if I apply a signal at port 1, I have 12 dB higher sensitivity. So uh, with this kind of directional sensor, I then have to come back and cancel the circuit, uh, cancel the interferer. So for that, we use a particular topology that has uh, been around for a while now in integrated circuits called the noise cancelling approach. And what this noise cancelling approach does is that you can inject a signal at a particular node in your LNA. And what happens is that when you inject that particular, uh, at that particular node, any noise that you inject is not seen at the output. So by using this kind of technique for cancellation, what we find is that we can do the sensing without introducing losses and do the cancellation without introducing too much noise. I mean, there is still some additional noise due to some paths, but uh, it becomes substantially better as you increase the number of elements in the array. So with this kind of technique, we implement uh, uh, an RFIC to demonstrate this. So this is a a four element uh, um, uh, MIMO array where Projection is, um, again, the philosophy of trying to build your analog part to null out interferers rather than to select the desired signals. Uh, can we extend this even more? So um, in the past uh, few years, there has been some interesting work done uh, in, uh, um, in the RF community based on 
uh, in path mitzvahs. Now this word builds on work that was done in the 70s, but RF. So it's like building a high-Q filter, but you move that high-Q filter from baseband to RF frequency. And you can tune this by changing the period of the LO. So basically, you now have a tunable, relatively high-Q filter. And this is uh, these, uh, uh, volt these uh, patterns or these frequency responses are the response at this particular node. So we're effectively achieving filtering right at the antenna output, at the input of the receiver, and this filter is tunable. So clearly this is a very useful thing uh, for building the kind of carrier aggregation or return fit. properties. It might be modulated by a certain code, it might be at a certain frequency, it might be from a certain direction. So if I think about these properties, I can start selecting and rejecting signals by driving these switches with appropriate sequences. So what you can do is you can think about these capacitors effectively working as correlators on orthogonal functions. And by defining a set of orthogonal functions which are correlated with the signal that you want to receive, you receive that signal and you reject everything else that the signal is not correlated, uh, that uh, these sequences are not correlated with. And now that you can do that, you can apply any orthogonal sequence to these switches and achieve sequence-based end-path filtering. So just to give you an example of that, Imagine that you have a, a signal which is code modulated, so it is spread spectrum, and you have a narrow band interferer. Now, when I drive these switches, I take my non-overlapping pulses and I multiply them with, a, with the same code that has been used to spread the original input signal. And then, if I look at my capacitors, these this code and this code will correlate with each other and I will get my desired signal and my in-band interferer will be spread out and I will get my I'll get processing gain. And remember, this processing gain now is not happening in digital. It's happening at RF. So I'm effectively rejecting the interferer that is there right at the antenna. So, um, and what you can also do is, instead of just correlating with one code, you can cascade these filters. So the first correlator works on looking at some part of the signal and receives it and lets the rest of the signal go through. The next correlator now correlates with some other uh, part of the signal and then receives that. So this over here is a concurrent two element code, code domain receiver. So what it can do is it can receive two code modulated signals at the same time by running the appropriate sequences on these end path filters. And this is a measurement, for example, where we don't do any coding. We just do it in the frequency domain in the most general way. You can think of frequency also as a kind of uh, 
code. And what we see is that um, uh, we keep the F2, one of the channels fixed, and we move the first channel center frequency F1. And what we can do is we can move that arbitrarily while keeping F2 at a certain frequency. So we have independent control of F1 and F2. So this is a dual frequency select filter in this mode. If you apply two codes, it becomes a, a dual code frequency receiver. And just to demonstrate where the rejection is happening, what we have over here is an input that is code modulated. And if the receiver is receiving that signal, then the signal just goes from port one to port two and then on to the receiver. If the receiver is rejecting or filtering that signal, then the signal power is reflected and you will see that at port three because the circulator will send it to port three. And what we see over here, this is the uh, input signal in red. The blue is when the receiver is code matched to the input. So it receives the signal, so you don't see any power in the third port. But when the code is mismatched, the receiver is actually rejecting the signal right at the receive input. So this is important because once you reject the jammer before the LNA, you don't amplify the jammer. So you have much better blotter tolerance. So we are able to show that we can reject uh, in the code domain. Uh, this is to show concurrent reception. So we have two coded signals that are occupying the same spectrum, just different codes. We are able to modulate the receiver with each of these codes and you're able to uh, concurrently receive signals. You can reject signals where we have a, a self-interferer which is modulated with a different code. We have a desired signal that is modulated with the same code as the receiver. So the receiver selects the uh, signal coming in from the antenna and rejects the signal coming in from the transmitter in this case. And what we can show is that without the uh, code rejection, uh, we again see a scrambled constellation and everything is cleaned up once we are able to run this correlator in order to reject interferers. So this is again an example of how you can start doing reconfigurable select reject filtering in analog in uh, uh, the receiver. So uh, what I uh, demonstrated was code domain and frequency domain. We can extend this to the spatial domain. So in the spatial domain, what we do is we have these bunch of these uh, correlators, which are driven by Walsh function sequences. If I take only one of them, I can show that basically I can get notches at a certain frequency. So this becomes a frequency domain reject filter, but then if I take an array of them where I have an n element array and I connect together the correlator outputs, I can show that now I basically am correlating across frequency and across spatial angle. So only signals uh, which are at a certain frequency and a certain angle will be rejected and the rest of the signals will just directly go through to my receive output. So with this kind of uh, correlator, we are able to demonstrate um, uh, a four element array. So this, is, so this is a four element MIMO array. And what we have is this uh, a notch filter that is correlated across them. And uh, this is now the measured pattern with this uh, spatial and frequency domain notch filter where what we are doing, uh, what we are demonstrating is, we can create two notches in the pattern for each element. And these two notches are independently controlled in terms of their angle of incidence and uh, frequency. So shown here is for example a measurement where this receive path is receiving signals from everywhere and all other frequencies except this particular handle and frequency and this particular handle and frequency. And by changing the, the sequences that I apply across the array, I can change now where these notches appear in handle and frequency. So again, this shows how you can do uh, MIMO spatial filtering 
but again, notch filtering. I'm not trying to select a signal. I will do that in the digital domain. And the RF and analog, I'm just interested in rejecting interferers. So that's, again, the philosophy of what we are doing. So this shows a similar measurement as I've shown in other cases. So if you see here, there is a desired signal and there is, uh, there is a desired signal here which is weak and an undesired blotter that is strong and the only uh, difference really between them is the angle of incidence. And what we see is that uh, if we uh, don't do anything about the blotter, we can't reject or recover our constellation. But once we enable our spatial filter, we are able to um, uh, receive the desired signal by rejecting the blotter. And this is happening at every element in this array. So we are not building a phased array. We are not throwing uh, uh, spatial information. We can form multi-beams at the digital domain if we want. So this is a flavor of the kind of things that people are now trying to do in RF and analog to support this vision of trying to build digital beamforming and MIMO arrays. So we are trying to scale these kind of approaches to millimeter wave now, but as we try to build these millimeter wave arrays, so what are the key challenges that we uh, see? So if I think about scalability in the array, the IC itself now is a problem that we can control very well. CMOS has excellent yields. We can make multiple parallel elements and expect that all of them are very well matched to each other because we have spent a lot of time in IC design trying to match transistors and match devices. But what we find is that the interface to the antenna becomes a problem. Because if I look at a typical package, for example, and this is a package that I uh, was involved in. Uh, it was designed by uh, IBM researchers. And uh, the idea here was to interface signals from the IC to some patch antenna arrays. And you see the complexity and you see from M1 through M12 in the package. So basically you have a large number of metal layers in the package which are distributing millimeter wave signals. So you need vias that are impedance controlled, you need alignment between each of these layers in order to build a, a package with low loss. So now if I have losses in my package, that is effectively like having a poor efficiency antenna. So I can begin with an antenna efficiency of 90%, lose 2 dB of my signal in the package, and I end up with an overall efficiency of 70%. And that's effectively like, for, like having fewer elements in my array. So now what that forces me to do is increase my array size, burn more power. What that does is heat up my package, lower the performance of each of my ICs. So this becomes a, a problem. So one way to solve this is, hey, can we eliminate the millimeter wave interface to the antennas? Why not put the antenna on chip, right? So this is a problem that people are working on. I saw just one in the probe station right here. And some of the fundamental problems though remain, which is that if I build the antenna, I can radiate it from the top of the antenna, but then silicon has a much higher epsilon than air. So it has sucking power in, so I lose efficiency. I say, okay, I'll protect signals from the silicon by putting a ground plane, but the distance between the bottom metal layer and the top metal layer of the antenna on the IC is not very large. So that gives me a bandwidth problem. So I need, I have this trade-off between bandwidth efficiency and um, one way to overcome it that people have talked about is, okay, let's try to do co-integration of the antenna with something else. So we put a substrate on top of the IC which has some patch antennas defined on it. And then we couple signals from the IC to this substrate. This works fine, it improves the efficiency. We can similarly put a lens on the back side of the IC to suck the power that silicon is naturally pulling and radiate out. This again improves efficiency. But this has a problem that, you know, there, there are um, uh, there's mechanical issues and how do I scale this out to an array? In this case, if I'm trying to build a digital array and I have a lot of IO at each element, I usually have the pads on the top of the IC. But if I put the substrate on top of the IC, then how do I take those signals out? So there are uh, issues with uh, wafer scale packaging here. What we have been doing uh, is proposing an approach where uh, we do an aperture coupled uh, antenna which has uh, some benefits. So the idea is that we put the feed layer on the IC 
and we put the ground plane with a slot on the IC. So this is the IC up, upside down. This is the top of the IC with the uh, either the solder bumps or where we wire bond, where the pads are. And this is the bat side of the IC. So what we then do is we thin the silicon at the bat side of the IC because we are usually dealing with uh, medium resistivity substrates. If you have a high resistivity substrate, you can get away without it. But uh, once you thin this silicon, you can put another layer and bond it to the wafer. And then you can define a patch antenna on that uh, uh, layer. And what we are doing is we are aperture coupling from this feed through the slot into the patch. And this is aperture coupled antennas are a well-known uh, wideband antenna approach. And uh, firstly, this benefit is very advantageous from a wafer scale because all I'm doing is I'm adding something to the back of the IC. I'm changing the substrate and adding patch antennas. So that's one benefit. There are no more millimeter wave vias to be routed on the package. The top of the package is still available for me to route all my digital LO, IF signals. So that's fine. And um, also, uh, I, I, I don't uh, have measured data on that yet, but we've been working on uh, approaches where you can put multiple of these laminates to build stack patches that have even wider bandwidth. So shown here is some kind of uh, uh, vision of what this looks like, which is, uh, we have circuits on the IC, these circuits drive this feed, this is a slot on the IC, and then we have the patch antenna on the substrate that is uh, bonded to the uh, uh, IC. The substrate that we've been working with is LCP, which has very good millimeter wave properties and is well matched to silicon in terms of its uh, CTE. And, uh, this shows uh, a, a demonstration of our approach. So we made the IC, we made a hole in uh, a particular substrate, put our IC inside it to wire bond, so this is the top. Then we are aperture coupling from the back of the IC down to the patch, which is on the LCP. So with this kind of approach, we are able to show millimeter wave performance that uh, gives us efficiency in the 50% range in measurements, our simulations are much higher. So um, there is a lot of challenges with doing these kind of measurements, but uh, we believe that this is a very scalable path because one of the other advantages that I have with this now is my feed network is on the IC. And on an IC, I can make very precise metallization. So now I'm not just restricted to a single polarization feed. I can do a dual polarization feed. I can actually control the impedances on my feed because I no longer am also worried about a 50 ohm environment. I just, the antenna needs to match my LNA or the PA needs to match my antenna. I don't need to be in 50 ohms because it's all under my control. So we build these, uh, for example, dual port feeds with a cross slot on the IC. And this is again coupling to the patch antenna. And what we can sh uh, show is that we can get dual pole, but there is also one uh, key uh, challenge here, which is this silicon area is pretty expensive. So if I'm spending all of this silicon area on a ground plane and a slot, that's not very efficient. So what I can do is I can uh, take advantage of this aperture coupled approach, because in the aperture coupled approach, this ground plane is separating the patch antenna from whatever circuits that I have over here. And if I build all my circuits in terms of transmission line which use this ground plane, I can reuse this ground plane layer of the antenna. So for example, over here, I could preserve the ground plane and build all my transmission line circuits around or I could move them inside my ground plane. So now I'm reusing the ground plane of my antenna, so I'm not paying an area overhead, and I'm still getting this dual pole uh, operation by taking feeds from these LNAs and driving these uh, slots. So you can see that this is a fairly compact dual pole 60 gigahertz uh, receiver, and we've uh, we packaged it and even put in some ability to cancel cross-polarization. So we can take each polarization signal and lead some of it to the other polarization to cancel it. So at the end, the output, it looks like an antenna which, is, which has pure polarization. So we don't have a 
cross-pull with this approach. So shown here are some measurements where we can basically get uh, 44 dB rejection uh, between the polarization. So between one pole and the other pole, we are isolated by 44 dB. And you can think about polarizations as two orthogonal media. So this basically means I can double the data rate that I have by sending signals on both polarizations. So these are some of the things that we can do with uh, multi-feed antennas. And this is an active area of research that we are looking, for, looking at where we are adding um, the number of feeds and also co-integrating more tightly with the uh, design of the LNA and PA. Now, the other challenge is that I want all my array elements to be coherent, so I need to distribute an LO to them. Now, the uh, uh, standard way of distributing the LO would be to go with a reference, have a PLL in each element, but every time I go through a buffer, I add noise. So this is a daisy chain technique. I could think of an H3 technique where I then distribute uh, in an H3 and then this noise is the same at each element. Uh, the, uh, or I could also actually do this instead of distributing the reference, I could actually generate a single LO and I distribute it to all the elements. So I have all these trade-offs, but this really represents the simplest way of distributing the signal for me. I would like to be able to distribute a reference and still not have to pay this phase noise penalty. So what we uh, uh, proposed was a, a dual input PLL scheme. So first think about a PLL that has two inputs. So it's basically reacting to a reference coming from this direction and a reference coming from this direction. And then we get the PLL output. So it's basically locked to the neighbor on this side and locked to the neighbor on that side. And what we also then showed was a circuit scheme by which we can distinguish between signals going in this direction and this direction. So on a single wire, we have a reference traveling from here to here and a reference traveling from here to here. So if we do that on a single wire, we basically have no overhead compared to a daisy chain scheme because a daisy chain scheme would also only have a single wire between the PLLs. But by doing this bi-directional locking, one way to think about it is that we are building a large resonator that is using the resonators on all the ICs to lock them together. And when you do that, if you take N LOs, you get a factor of N improvement in the phase noise. And uh, we have demonstrated that, and also this is a demonstration of the improvement of the daisy-chained approach. So if I take these PLLs which are here, all I'm doing is I'm cascading them in a daisy-chain manner, and my PLL phase noise plot looks like the black curve. But now we shift it to the coupled approach. So over that single wire, we are distributing references in both directions. And what you can see is that the coupled approach basically achieves uh, better uh, phase noise and gives you jitter improvement. And we have not really paid too much overhead in power consumption because these PLLs would be operating anyway. It's just that instead of having one reference, they are basically getting references from both directions. So this is one example of trying to solve the analog or LO distribution problems in a large scale array where analog can give us some benefits. Now, a similar problem exists in the IF interface. Now, in a digital array, I want to take all the outputs and uh, do digital beamforming on them. So if I consider only a phased array, people have proposed solutions where there is a single cable connecting the phased array to the digital backend where basically all the signals that are required are multiplexed on that single cable. So you have uh, the reference at a low frequency, you have control signals that are going between the radios, and then the IF signal at a different frequency. So then by using uh, frequency filters, you can distinguish uh, directions. What we are now working on in collaboration with Columbia University is an approach where we can extend this to MIMO arrays. So we want to still have a single cable connecting the array tile, but now instead of doing an array combiner, we actually have signals coming from all the elements, but we now want to multiplex these larger number of signals. So let's say we have a four element array, we have four times the signal now, that we want to multiplex over this single wire and send this through to the baseband, so, uh, baseband IC. So um, 
This is again an important problem if we want to practically realize uh, uh, digital arrays because um, ultimately we can imagine, for example, on a phone that there would be uh, arrays located at different parts of the phone and they'll be routed through to the same digital processor. And uh, so how do you uh, do this routing in a simple way? You want to multiplex all those signals onto a single uh, interface. So this is something that we are currently working on. So to conclude, um, what do we see as our vision for arrays over the next decade? I hope uh, you've seen some demonstrations of how we need to basically think of arrays no longer as combined arrays in the analog domain, but as nulling arrays, where we want to reject interferers and then form beams and do all the digital signal processing at the back end. And this extends not just to spatial filtering, but to frequency filtering as well with carrier aggregation. So we basically, uh, our job as analog or RF designers becomes how to preserve dynamic range and reject interferers. Uh, there have been interesting work done in NPATH mixers that shows that these kind of filters can be made reconfigurable and by using them as correlators we can achieve electrospace, a generalized electrospace filter which uh, BA and other groups are trying to extend to higher operating frequency. Finally, from a practical perspective, we know how to build an element on an IC pretty well right now, but the real challenges are how do we get millimeter wave signal into and out of the IC in a large scale manner, and how do we take all these digital and IF outputs into and out of the IC in a scalable manner. So those are the problems I expect will occupy us over the next decade as we try to transition to a world of uh, digital arrays. Finally, um, this has been a continual axis along integrated technologies where we have tried to shift to higher and higher operating frequencies uh, and uh, demonstrate CMOS and bi CMOS operation at frequencies exceeding uh, 100 gigahertz to move well into the submillimeter wave and terahertz region. This will, I think, also be an uh, ongoing effort. And I think in this space, uh, CMOS, uh, we again know what it's going to do. So what we need is new technologies that can be heterogeneously integrated with CMOS, where CMOS does what it's good at, and then the final front ends are built in those three, five technologies. So uh, with that, I'll conclude, and thanks for your attention, and be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for the exciting talk. We have time for a couple of questions. So that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, sure. So the question is, how do we determine the interferer property? So, this is a problem that uh, we have very carefully punted to somebody else. So the uh, general, sorry, let me just pull up that slide. Yeah. So the general problem here is, where do you identify this interferer from? There have been multiple solutions proposed. So one solution is that you try to make sure that at the output here, all signals are at equal power going into the ADC. So if you see something, some direction that is very strong, you try to reduce the, you introduce a null in that direction so that by the time you get to the ADC, every signal is kind of equalized, right? So that's one approach. The other approach has been an algorithm that says that if you have a signal stronger than X, I know it's a jammer, I'm going to null it out, right? Uh, I think that's, a, in, from my perspective, that's a digital domain problem, actually. I think identifying what the interferer is and providing the input saying, this is the interferer that needs to get canceled, that is, to me, a digital algorithm running at the back end. And it's probably an iterative loop that converges and then tells you where the interferer is. But that's a, the latency of that is actually a very interesting problem to work on. How do you do this interferer identification and come back and cancel it quickly? That's a very interesting problem. Any more questions? Yes. Yes, uh, the, this uh, cancellation scheme seems reminiscent of some old radar concept, side load Right. Something like that. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's some insights you can get from those old, older radar concepts. 
Right. So there are these older radar concepts where people have tried to build steerable nulls right at the antenna. They've tried to use an auxiliary antenna, for example, to receive and combat and cancel. So there have been those approaches. The, what we have been trying to do is to avoid any overhead compared to a, my regular array that I built and with that minimal overhead combat and cancel. But I think those techniques actually define the problem space very well because that's, uh, that's a reasonable way to do it. So for example, you could think of approaches where you have a large array and you dedicate some part of the array for interferer cancellation and some part of the array for reception, right? You could partition your array into a subarray approach. I think that will also happen. I think people have been proposing hybrid arrays and things like that, but that's a, that's a good point. I think uh, these kind of works have been done at millimeter wave using discrete components uh, before. The advantages with integration that we have are, like I said, small dimensions, ability to work in voltage domain, throw multiple transistors at the problem without paying any additional cost. So we need to use those to take away some of the trade-offs from the prior approaches. Yeah. I'd like to invite Professor Ted Rappaport, the director of NYU Wireless, to present you with a plaque in, appro oh, in appreciation thank for you. your participation. Professor Natarajan, thank you for that excellent talk. On behalf of NYU Wireless and the Department of Electrical and Computer thank Engineering, you. I'm going oh, to yeah. give you a yeah. fist bump in this plaque. Let's oh, give sure. Dr. Natarajan a big hand. Thank you. Thanks again, Ted, for inviting me. Uh, NYU does very pioneering work in this area, and it's truly an honor to be here and to give this talk. Thank, thank you, you very for much. Coming. And yeah. thank you, students and faculty, for attending this landmark series, Circuits, Terahertz, and Beyond.